Cool. Yeah. All right, so I'd like to begin our time together with a quote. It's on the, your handout. We shall do a great deal for the science of aesthetics once we perceive not merely by logical inference, but the immediate certainty of intuition. If you were to just guess who said that, what would you say? Is that Einstein? Einstein, okay, that's a good guess. Other guesses? Who, who says this? Chesterton. Chesterton, G.K. Chesterton. Okay, I like it, I like it. Any others? Friedrich Nietzsche. And I start with that quote because I think sometimes appearances can be deceiving. And some of you, very interesting, they've got like, you know, a, a, maybe a tech mogul, an idiot, you know, uh, Chesterton. Like, it's interesting to sometimes look at something and go, what, who said this? What's the context of it? But frankly, I chose this because I read this and I thought to myself, there's some orthodox I could hear saying this, right? Don't, don't trust reason. It's an all noose or something. Not untrue, but it needs some qualification, needs some explanation. And so in this course, which we'll have about six sessions of, I want to just sort of challenge that we can't rely on truisms of any sort. You know, the, the, a class context, I think, always demands a certain kind of rational inquiry. And it's very easy, Christians of any stripe, to lapse into early, like, easy answers. You know, we, the, as they always say, like, Sunday school answers, or even the easy orthodox answers. And so I want to challenge us to not to do that as much as possible. For today, what I'd like to do is essentially summarize the class, summarize the major ideas of what I would like to talk about over our six sessions and set up that inquiry. And so because it's so, so much summary, it's going to feel like a lot. It's going to feel like there's a lot of ideas. And so I just want to sort of set up this idea. It is a lot. And that's why we're going to slowly unpack it as we go. And the other thing I'd like to say before beginning is even though we don't have texts for this class, I didn't ask you to read anything, you don't have to read anything in principle, I'm a very text-focused guy. I like to read texts, I like to read them closely, I like to look at their context usually. We won't have time to read texts in their entirety, but you'll find I often quote stuff. I often like to point to texts, I often like my thoughts and our thoughts to be grounded in texts, if for no other reason, and that the people we're reading have sort of withstood the test of time. And that goes especially for the Holy Fathers, right? We call them Holy Fathers and we talk about tradition precisely because we think that these are ideas worth knowing, worth thinking about because they have withstood the test of time. But here's another question. This course is about beauty. What is beauty? Just initial sort of thoughts about what it is to be beautiful. It's in the eye of the beholder. It's in the eye of the beholder. Good. Other thoughts. They don't have to be your thoughts. They can just be things you've heard. What, what, did, what do you think of beauty? What do you think about? A heartfelt action. Heartfelt action. I like that. Heartfelt action. I have to be Heartfelt action. Others? Nothing. Virtue. Virtue. Oh, I definitely like that. Virtue. So, just so we're clear, we got a little bit of relativism. We got something about passion, I'd imagine. Something about character. Other thoughts about beauty. Coherence. Coherence. Say a little more. Like, what do you mean by coherence? That everything uh, comes together. Makes sense. Good. Okay. So there's a certain kind of. Uh, I'll I'll add to you a little bit. Coherence. A certain harmonious relationship in something. Yeah. Good. Other kind of canons of beauty, when we look at a beautiful piece of art or sculpture or what have you, piece of music, like what are some things that we tend to be looking for when we say it's beautiful? Symmetry. Symmetry. Very good. Symmetry, proportion. Of course, this, this is sometimes tough when there's some music that's very disharmonious. And do we find it beautiful? Okay, I want you to kind of keep all of those. I mean, we could keep going, and I wish I had kind of my, my little whiteboard. I'd like to put those somewhere. But for now, kind of keep those in mind, because I think each of those is, is right in some way, as, as we'll see, or at least it's been said by someone who at least is, you know, seemingly intelligent. But here is a different question, and I need, like, a volunteer who will just let me interrogate them, who is brave in this respect. Too bad it's you. Uh, so, why are you here? <clears throat> why, why are you here today? I want to learn about Christianity. You want to learn about Christianity? Why? Um, 
Because I believe it can make me happy. That was so quick. Dang, I didn't expect that. That was glorious because I think it can make me happy. That's all I was looking for, frankly. I can ask any of you the same question. I do this to my students all the time. Why are you here? What are you doing? Why are you doing it? And if you really interrogate that structure, I've never had them that quickly. Frankly, I'm really surprised. In sort of three steps. Usually, right, you'll, you'll get a, a, a whole litany, but you might say, you know, I'm here because I think uh, it will give me a good job. Well, why do you want a good job? Well, I think it will make me some money. Why do you want money? Because I want to buy certain things. Why do you want to buy certain things? Because I think it will give me pleasure. Well, why do you want pleasure? Because I think it will make me happy. This goes all the way back to Aristotle in the sense that we do things for the sake of some good, for the sake of some end. And so any seemingly finite object of our desire, say money, has a further end. I don't want money for its own sake. I want money because it can buy me something. And I don't want that thing for its own sake. I want it because it will give me comfort or something like this or power or status. And I don't want those for their own sake. I want those because I think ultimately it contributes to my happiness. And happiness, in Greek eudaimonia, is our flourishing. And for the ancient philosophical tradition, this meant the good. As Aristotle says, all of our acts are for the sake of some good. But it's not just some good, some particular good, it's goodness as such I want. I want the good, I want the whole pie, not a piece of it, because I know that all these desires I have ultimately have the singular aim. Call it happiness, call it the good, it doesn't matter. Our, we have this structure, the structure of our reality, the structure of our desires, the structure of the ways we act and why we do the things we do. And the good is the beginning and the end of all of that desire, right? Because I desire the good, it prompts me initially, it's because I'm seeking it that I take that first step in desiring something. But then of course, it's not just that discrete thing that I want, it's this further thing I want. And so, in the tradition that we're going to talk about, which is ultimately the Orthodox tradition, these, are the, these become the highest categories, things like goodness, truth, beauty, and oneness. Sometimes these are called the transcendentals in, in the Western tradition. But why are these the highest goods? And so I wanna to turn to this, our, our first quote, I guess it's our second quote. I've meant to put some numbers next to this, so you have to forgive me, it would make it easier. But it's the Plato quote from the Republic. You might be familiar with this. Both knowledge and truth are beautiful things, but the good is other and more beautiful than they. In the visible realm, light and sight are rightly considered sun-like, but it is wrong to think that they are the sun. So here it is right to think of knowledge and truth as good-like, but wrong to think that either of them is the good, for the good is yet more prized. Very classic passage of the Republic where Plato talks about the analogy of the sun. This will later go on in his allegory of the cave where what we're doing is we're moving from shadows, of course, to higher and higher levels of reality, the shadow in the cave, to the things that cast those shadows, to things in the external world, to the reflections, ultimately to the sun itself. And the sun, as we know quite well, it's the cause of everything. It gives us sight to see, it causes nutrition and growth and everything, it provides food without the sun, we're doomed. And the sun is an analogy, Plato thinks, a visible analogy, for something higher and more transcendent. In the intellectual realm, there is the good. In the same way, the good, the true, the beautiful, cause us to think, to know, to desire these higher order values. Again, not just these material things, but again, even a higher order value as simple as glory. It's like, where you can't go to Walmart and get yourself some glory, right? You can't get yourself some fame, you can't get yourself some justice, some equality. These higher order goods are not found easily in the material world, and yet they are ultimately the objects of our desire. But I want to continue right there, just in that passage, bring it up to you start to see already in Plato the connection between truth, beauty, and goodness. 